So we're in this series, Love is Born, and we're talking about love. And, and, and this week I've been studying for uh, the sermon today, Love is Near. And, and man, all week I've just been studying and reading. It's like nothing's coming together. Just, it's just a horrible week it felt like. And, and I know there was some distraction. My daughter, you know, most of you know, or some of you know, my daughter left on Tuesday to go to India and Nepal for six months. They left Tuesday. They're supposed to be in India on Wednesday. And they left on Tuesday, and we didn't hear nothing. We didn't hear nothing. They were supposed to be at their destination. Didn't hear nothing and didn't hear nothing. And, and we finally found out that when they got to, to uh, a place in India, Delhi or somewhere in India, and they're supposed to go to another part of the country, I don't know, some big word that starts with a V, and they were supposed to get on another flight, and they didn't get on that flight for whatever reason. And um, they were stuck in this place. And then they finally, we found out after the fact that they ended up on a train that was supposed to take 12 hours, and it took them 24 hours. But in the process of this whole thing, you know, here we are as parents, we're at home, and it's like, what can I do? Nothing. I can pray. You know, someone had suggested in the midst of this, you know, you could go over there, Glenn, and help. And I'm like, yeah, what am I going to do? I'm going to jump on a plane and fly to a place. I don't even know where they're at. And then what am I going to do? You know, by the time I get there, who knows where they're at? So we just pray. And so all week I've been just like in this turmoil, like, okay, God, you know, can't there be a little order in the midst of this chaos? I mean, so they ended up getting a train where they were supposed to get a flight. They only allowed them to exchange a couple hundred bucks because they were out of money at this place that they were at, which means that there was a team of six that had $200. They had to buy train tickets to go to this location. And after they bought their train tickets, they had enough money left to buy each other, uh, to buy everybody one granola bar and three crackers. And so and then they had a 24-hour train ride. It was supposed to take 12 hours. So for 24 hours, they had a granola bar, three crackers, and traveled across the country on a train that took 12 hours longer than it was supposed to take for a 12-hour ride. Kind of makes you go this way as a parent. It's chaos, right? We live in a world that's filled with chaos, and so all week it just felt like there's just more chaos and more chaos and more chaos. And so finally, to top it all off, on Saturday morning I took my wife shopping. I hate shopping. Like for me, shopping is making a mental list of what I want, and then I decipher in my mind the quickest way to get into the store, to get to that location. So like, for example, there's two reasons to go to Walmart. Get deodorant and get oil and oil filters for your car. And if you need oil and oil filters, if you go in back by the automotive section, you go flying past the automotive people, it's about 75 steps inside the store. You can get your oil filter and your oil. You can come back out. Forrest will check you out right there at the thing, and then you leave. It's, like, really cool. Or if you need deodorant, you come in the front door, and you go about seven aisles down and up to the right-hand side, and you can get out through the Expedia check. I mean, it's like there's terrorists in that place. You don't want to go there. Shopping is not of God. You don't want to go shopping this time of year. But I took my wife shopping yesterday for a couch. She's been after me for five years, and I finally give in. And so we went down to King's. It's really nice to go down there. They have, a, they have a place you can sit, and they said you can bring your sack lunch. You can just sit on a recliner, and your wife can do the shopping she wants to do. It's, it's all good. But, but we got this couch and chair. And then on the way home, that wasn't enough. We had to stop at Walmart. So I hung out in the car, and she went inside to get her stuff. But as she was going inside the one store, I was like, you know, we've got to redeem the moment. And, and I noticed these three high school students, they were wearing a Letterman jacket. You know they're high school students. You know, like, if anybody needs a Letterman jacket, i got four of them for sale. They're covered with dust in our house. Some of them even have letters on them. You can make a good deal on them. You know, you, you buy a Letterman jacket, it's $299 for the Letterman jacket and all the letters on it. But I'll sell you one for a third of that, you know, and it'll include the letters because I just collecting dust. But anyway, these kids are standing there with these Letterman jackets. And, and so I told Violet, I said, give them some money. At least redeem the moment. So she handed them some money. She went inside. I'm like, at least we saved a little bit of the moment. But there's chaos, right? This world is filled with chaos. You turn on the radio, you hear all this stuff that's going on. There's houses being burnt because someone in the midst of whatever, they, they lit fires in Tennessee and we burned down houses and cities. We have wars that are happening across our country. There's people on the other side of the ocean that are dealing with loss of everything because of all these wars. We turn on the news and you watch the news and there's such a political upheaval in our own country. You can't imagine it could get any worse, but it keeps getting crazier every day and and you go to these shopping centers you know i mean like 
what was last week or two weeks ago, we had Black Friday and people were camping out in stores for stuff. Are you kidding me? It's like, dude, that's crazy. I, I can't believe how chaotic people are. It's like, why would you camp out to go shopping ever? You know, if people shop like me, you wouldn't have to have as many stores. It'd be simple. Just have a computer, you know. So, like, my idea of good shopping is just sitting on your couch in your house and you find the gun you want and you order it and they ship it to you. Well, what does a man need? You need a gun to kill something to drag it home so you can eat it. You know, it's a part of the biblical concept. So, today we want to talk about love is near. And, and love is near is really understanding how do we understand order in the midst of the chaos that we live in, right? It, it's chaotic. It, people... This time of the year, people are really in bad moods and they don't feel good and they don't look good and, and life is really tough because they have to buy gifts for people they don't really care for with money that they don't have. They have to go to dinner with people they don't really want to sit next to and, and then they're dealing with all the pressures of, of life and how do we bring order to that? And so this morning, I want to take you to, I think, what is one of the most beautiful stories of order coming out of chaos in Scripture, and it's how God defines love to us. I believe that one of the things that we need to be aware of in this culture is that God is the one that defines love. God defines love. Now, now we know that God showed His love. He demonstrated His love for us in, in the beginning in creation, right? He created us, and He, he, put, us, he put man in, in the Garden of Eden, and He created animals and birds, and, and He said, look, Rule over them. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. It's like, wow, we get to do that. And then, then he, he gave us flowers. He said, you get, to, you get to smell the flowers. You get to look at the flowers. You get, to, you get to enjoy all of this creation. That's a part of what he does for us. That's a, that's a part of God de demonstrating his love to us. But he really defined his love a couple of thousand years ago when he sent his son. We, we understood or we thought we understood love. And then he, Jesus came and God really is beginning to define love to us in a whole new way. He's showing how in the midst of chaos, God can bring order. Luke chapter 1, starting with verse 26. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Very was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, if I'm Mary at this moment, I'm saying, Don't talk to me no more. I don't want to hear it. Something tough is coming. I just know it. I mean, when someone comes to me and they start saying those kinds of nice things, I'm like, Okay, what's the punchline? It's coming. It's coming. You know, when I go to my wife and I say, Honey, let me buy you a couch. She's like, What do you want to buy for yourself? <laughs> you know, <laughs> a gun. <laughs> What, what's coming next? You know, Mary says the same thing. says next. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. In her mind, she's saying, an angel comes to me, it never happens. An angel starts saying, you who are highly favored, never happens. What to expect? Mary is troubled. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so that the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. She who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Wow. Mary's getting ready to give birth to a child. She's, she's getting ready to go on a journey that she has no idea what to expect. She's a teenager engaged to be married. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon her. She's going to be with child. She's going to be pregnant. She has no idea what that, what's it like. I mean, how do you explain the Immaculate Conception? You got a good word for it? I don't. Quite frankly, I don't know how you would explain that. If you, if you are Mary, what would you say? I mean, that is chaos. I'm, I'm engaged to be married, and, oh, by the way, I'm pregnant. I don't know how it happened. It just happened. Yeah, right. If I'm Joseph, I'm, I'm running. Like, dude, I don't need any part of this. 
And it says in the scripture that Joseph had in mind to separate from her quietly, but then he didn't. Because the Holy Spirit came to him and said, it's okay, Joseph, this can happen. And so what, what turns into really a beautiful story of God's redemption is chaos. I mean, the whole story is chaos. The Immaculate Conception, this, this girl that's going to have a baby and she doesn't know how it happens. Her, her cousin who's old is going to have a baby. It doesn't happen. She's called to go off on a census that she didn't want to be a part of an imposed sentence. She gets to an end that is filled up. There's no room. I mean, why would you ever script it this way? If you or I were writing the story, I'm sure we would do it much better than that, right? We would, we would make sure that, that Mary and Joseph would have a much neater relationship and they would end up in a beautiful in and they would have a whirlpool in their room and they would have a midwife or at least a doctor there and they would have access to whatever medication is needed and we'd make sure that everything was good and they would, we would have bells and whistles and all kinds of sirens. I mean the baby has been born. It's Jesus. How could it be any smaller? You know, we'd have to make it big. I mean the Macy's Day Parade would look small compared to what we would do, right? It was chaos. I mean, the little village was full of people that were wide-eyed and wondering why they were there. They were paying taxes they didn't want to pay. They were doing things they didn't really want to do. And God said, I'm going to make something good come out of all this. It's the world we live in. God has defined to us his love in the birth of Jesus. Let's, let's look a little deeper and see how God triumphs in this story with Mary. So if you go to Matthew chapter 1, and don't even turn to it, I just want you to listen. In Matthew chapter 1, we have the account of Jesus' birth, right? His genealogy. I'm sure that most of you read chapter 1 of Matthew on a daily basis. And, and if you don't, you might actually want to try it for a while. But it's an incredible, incredible story of God making order out of chaos. So as I read this genealogy of Jesus, and I've read it hundreds and hundreds of times, literally... Uh, I want you to think about the persons that are here, all right? A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nashan, Nashan the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz whose mother was Ruth, or was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. Whew. That's the first section. You talk about scandal. We'll get there in a little bit. David, the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amon. Amon, the father of Josiah. Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile in Babylon. Another whole load. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Ebayud. Ebayud, the father of Eliakim. Eliakim, the father of Azar. Azar, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Achim. Achim, the father of Eliud. Eliud, the father of Eleazar. Eleazar, the father of Mathan. Mathan, the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus called the Christ. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with the whole story, but let me just tell you a little bit about it. It's an amazing story. So we start off with Abraham and Isaac and Jake. I call them my Amish relatives, Abike, Jake, and Joe, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. It's the Amish in our, in our genealogy. Jacob and Esau fought. Jacob connived and stole a birthright from his brother. His brother wanted to kill him. Why would you choose that to be the genealogy of Jesus? And then we go on a little bit further, and we have Judah having a relationship with his daughter-in-law, Tamar, who had been abandoned. 
So, so in their custom, if, if, a, if a husband died and there was no children, his brother was to marry the wife and have children in his brother's name. And if that one died and so forth, well, Tamar married all these brothers except for the last one. Judah kept him away because he didn't want his last one to die. And so Tamar was thinking, I need to have a child in memory of my first husband. And so she dressed up like a whore. And when Judah's off to go get his sheep sheared, he's looking for someone to have relationships with. He sees this woman alongside the road. He takes her off. They have a child. They have twins. And wow, what a scandalous deal. I mean, I can't imagine what we would do with that in the press today. But it doesn't stop there. It goes beyond that. From Tamar, we go on down and we have finally when a bunch of spies get into to Jericho and they're looking to get out of Jericho, get out of Dodge without getting in trouble. And, and they go to the local whore's house and she takes care of them. And they say, look, if you take care of us, if you do what we tell you to do, your family will be saved. And we know that Rahab is saved. And Rahab becomes the, fa the mother of Boaz... Boaz then marries Ruth, who is a foreigner. You're not supposed to marry a foreigner if you're a good Jewish person. And she's someone that's a foreigner. Boaz marries her, and she becomes the father, or the mother, of the line of Jesus. And then we go a little bit further, and we have David. David was an adulterer. His son, heaven forbid we talk about all the stuff that that Solomon did. He was a philanderer, which is a really nice way to say a womanizer. Solomon had all these women that he was the wisest man in the world, and then he succumbed to all this desire he had, and it caused disruption. In fact, because of his sin, the kingdom was taken away from him. It was divided, and then it went off into to disruption. And then we, we keep on moving down further, and finally we have the, the Israelites having walked away from God. They were taken into captivity, and then we get a little further down the road, and then finally... Mary and Joseph come together and Mary deals with the Immaculate Conception while she's engaged to be married and Jesus is born. You talk about chaos. You have more chaos in your family. It doesn't get any crazier than that. I, I just amazed. And so here we have David who was a warrior, had an affair with Bathsheba. When he's supposed to be out fighting wars, he's off having an affair. We have all this crazy stuff. The point of this is that Jesus was born not because of his great genealogy, but in spite of them. God began to work at bringing order. You see, Jesus came to hold it all together. Jesus came to hold it all together 2,000 years ago, and even today he's working to hold it all together. Do you have chaos in your life? Dude, I, I know what it was like yesterday. I mean, this is still like four weeks to Christmas or three weeks to Christmas, sitting there in the truck that's as close as I want to get to shopping. Sit in the truck and hold the key. I mean, I was ready at any given moment. She comes out the door, poof, I'm there. It's like a getaway car, you know? You laugh, it's true. I, I, I was ready. You look at people, there's people that are hurrying into the store, and they're like, am I going to get it? Is it going to be there yet? And others are like, I can't believe I'm going in here. It's awful. You have other people that are like being drugged by their ears or following their mom or their dad. We, it's an awful situation. It's terrible. It's just... It's just you can't believe how chaotic it is. Well, that's, that's the world we live in. And in our own lives, we're dealing with chaos. We have jobs that we don't like or jobs that are not working out. We have people that are in our families that ourselves maybe even that we're dealing with health crises and difficulties. We have employees or employer relationships that are bad and not so good. We, we have marriages that are struggling. We have environments around us that are just despicable. There's all this stuff going on. And, and in spite of all this stuff... God is still bringing order today. And God is the one that has defined love. It's as his love is near us. It comes in the form of Jesus Christ. Every day, Jesus came to hold it together, and he wants you and I to be able to experience that and walk and work and live with that. Listen as I read from Colossians chapter 1, the message. Okay, this is the message. I love how he defines this. He says, uh, Colossians 1 verses 15 to 18 from the message. We look at his, the son and see God who cannot be seen. We look at this son and see God's original purpose in everything created. For everything, absolutely everything above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank of angels, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him.
He was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this moment. And when it comes to the church, he organizes and holds it together like a head does a body. You see, God defined his love to us by holding everything together. He did it then. He does it now. He's in the business of holding it together. So instead of worrying about everything, pray. This week I can tell you as much as I, I thought about my daughter and her team being gone and all the chaotic stuff that's happening, I, I just began to pray and just felt this release like there's nothing I can do, but it's okay because God can do what needs to be done. He, we, we, can, we don't have to worry. We can pray. God handles it. He loves us. We, we know that he will supply all our needs. He tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, he says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. God's love is near us in the form of Jesus Christ. And when it feels like it's falling apart, cling to him. He can handle it. David asked a question in Psalms chapter 11, verse 3. He asked this question. He said, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? That's our question, right? That's our question. We, we ask that question on a daily basis in some capacity. What can we do, God? How can we make a difference? I, I can't change everything around the world. I can't change all this stuff, but God can. How do we make a difference? I don't know. And David, interestingly, he answers his question from verse 3 in verse 4, but not with an answer, with a declaration. He like takes a stick out and drives the stake in the ground. This is what he says in verse 4. He says this, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes examine them. You know what David says? He asks the question, what can the righteous do? And, and it's really kind of a rhetorical question. He's really saying, there's absolutely nothing we can do, folks. But, but the Lord is on the throne. The Lord is in heaven, and he sees, and he knows, and he cares. You see, when everything falls apart, God still has it together. When everything is shaken and breaking, God is unshakable. When it's coming apart at the seams, every crisis that comes along, God has a resolve to it. And as a people, in every crisis, we have to come face to face with God. And it's in the midst of coming face to face with Him, we see that He is unshakable. He's unbreakable. He's unchangeable. He's uncharacteristically kind and loving and has the best in store for us. In all of life, he's unshakable. When Joseph was in the, in the cistern of a well where his brothers had threw him, he was still in charge. When Joseph was in prison, he was only one decision away from being in charge of the whole country. Why? Because God is unshakable. God has a plan. God has a purpose. Daniel, one of the brightest and the best of all the people, was carried off into captivity. And God saw that, and God had a plan. And when, when Daniel thought everything was being lost, God was working out a plan, and Daniel became a person giving great counsel to the king. When Moses, he, he was born at a time when little baby boys weren't supposed to be born. He was put in a papyrus basket along the river Nile. He should have been drowned and gone. Instead, God had a plan and he was rescued and put into the king's household. And then while he's living in the king's household, he killed a man and he went off to the wilderness to get away. But God was still working on his plan. And it wasn't so many few years later, he's tending his father-in-law's sheep. Now, I can't see how you can go much more low. You're, you're, you're in the king's household. You're considered a son of the king. You have all this great stuff. And all of a sudden, eventually you end up out here in the wilderness as a shepherd, a sheep herder. Kind of a lowly job. But God had a plan. And God spoke to Moses and called him back to lead the children of Israel out to the promised land. God has built a church even today of people that are broken and filled with chaos and he's taken us from tragedy to triumph all through Jesus no matter where we go no matter what we do he is near and he wants to redeem us his love is everywhere his love is near our world how does our world define love well quite frankly in a really horrible way our world defines love by doing what you want you deserve it. 
You earn it. You owe it to yourself. Love is about doing for me whatever it is that makes me feel good. Love is about doing what I want in the way I want, however I want. It's very self-seeking. It's self-centered. It's selfish. It's destructive. It destroys. That's what our world defines. And we, we live in a world that's filled with chaos. It's filled with disobedience. In fact, there's a beautiful article that, that Julie had posted on her Facebook page, and I, I shared it on mine. And if you want to read it, I would challenge you to go to my Facebook page or Julie's or whoever else has done it. There's a beautiful article by John Piper that talks about raising up kids of obedience. But here's the kick behind that whole thing. It's not just kids. It's all of us as a people being obedient to God. That's really our third point today, actually. Our third point is we've got to understand that how our obedience, it really defines our love. And, and as we're obedient to God, it defines love. It, obedience is, uh, is, is freedom. Freedom is not just coming to my own desires and saying, okay, I'll do what I want, when I want, where I want, however it happens to be. That isn't freedom. That's bondage. So our world defines love as do it yourself, but our obedience really defines the love as we're obedient to God. Let me read from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if, if you're aware, is, is, is a beautiful love chapter. And, and we need to be reminded sometimes of what it says. Listen to this. He says, And now I show you the most excellent way. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of long, wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always hopes. It always trusts. It always perseveres. Love never fails. Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there is tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in the mirror, but then we, will see, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. These three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. I believe as a people, when we understand our obedience to God is really defining love in ourselves and in those around us. It changes things. You see, God's love is near, and it happens as we live our life in the way that he calls us to. Love is near at all times. He says, John, Jesus says it this way in John chapter 14. He says, Verily truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, obedience is the key to God's love. And that's how God defines it. He wants us to be obedient to him. It's not obedient to me. It's not obedient to, to yourself. It's obedient to him. And, and, and as we are obedient to him, he says we can do amazing things. Well, we're not limited. It says we can do even greater things than he did. I can't fathom that. I, I, maybe you can, but I can't. I, I, I just am blown away again this week as I'm reminded that it's in obedience to God that amazing things happen and the freedoms that come with that. So, so here's my last question for you. Are you willing to share that love? Are you really willing to share that love? Verse 13 that I just read. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So I asked myself the question this week. So, so yesterday, you know, I've been, I was struggling all week trying to figure out how this is going to come together. And I, I was studying and, and I was reminded again that, you know, my, my friend Eldon said, you never can study for a sermon, but all your studies can come a sermon. So I, I gave up hope yesterday morning. I'm like, okay, God, I don't know if this is going to happen. So I went shopping in the morning. It's not recommended. And then I got home from shopping, and I went and chased some deer around for some guys that were supposed to hit them, but they couldn't. That was depressing. 
So I'm sitting in my office last night at 10 o'clock. I, I never, I don't know when I've last been in my study at the church at 10 o'clock on a Saturday night. It just don't happen. I'm like, God, I don't, I don't, this isn't working. I, I don't know what to say. How, how do we share your love or how do we show your love? And he, he took me to, to, to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3 is the story of John the Baptist. Julie used a little bit of it in the offering time. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Licinius, tetrarch of Abilene. And by the way, those three dudes were evil to the core of their being. They were like despicable, deplorables, truly. They were awful. This happened during the high priesthood of Ananias, Caiaphas. The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. He went into the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. And this is what he says. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall come, become straight and the rough ways smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warn you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. He's talking about us, okay? If you can't produce fruit, I'm going to be done with you at some point in time. Then he says, then they say, Well, what shall we do then? The crowd asks. And this is John's answer. The man who has two tunics should share with him who has none. The one who has food should do the same. The tax collectors also came and were baptized. And they said, teacher, what should we do? And he said, don't collect more than you're required to. Then some soldiers came and asked him, what should we do? And he replied, don't extort money or accuse people falsely, but be content with your pay. People were waiting, expecting, we were all wondering if their hearts might, in their hearts, if John might possibly be the Christ. And John answered them, I baptize you with water, but the one more powerful than me that will come, the thongs of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So, what do we do? He says, here's what you do. You give to those in need. You be honest. You be forthright and truthful. You live with obedience. So here's what God impressed on my heart last night, about 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock this morning. Actually, I, I sent a text to April Beck at 10.30 last night. I, I know you're not supposed to call people, but I thought, it's safe. I'll text her. And, and, you know, that way I will only make her curious about more, right? So here's what we're going to During the month of December, every Sunday, we're going to have a challenge of how we can live something out in some way. I'm going to give you a challenge you don't have to participate if you don't want to, but I invite you to. And today, here's what I would like for us to do is that um, every week, April gives backpacks full of food to 15 to 18 kids that need food. Their families are poor and don't have much. And, and I would like for us to be able to give each of these families a really good, healthy Christmas dinner. And so I know that I'm not asking you to all go shopping. So here's what, here's what I know that we're going to do is we're going to take up an offering right now. I know you're not prepared necessarily, and that's fine if you're not. But I'm going to invite you to give whatever you can this morning. And we're going to use this money to make sure that these 18 kids all get a good, healthy Christmas meal. And any monies that goes above what we need for them to have a Christmas meal, we're going to buy food to put in those backpacks for as long as we need to to help the work that April is doing and reaching out. We want to make a difference in our community. Here's the second piece. If you don't want to give that money, I understand. You don't have to. There's a Christmas tree out here in the foyer, and it's filled with little tags of things that are needed for bringing Christmas cheer to our community. If you don't want to do the gifts for the, the kids, I want you to grab a tag off the tree, go to Walmart. On your way there, be thinking about what the closest door is to get what you need to get. Run in there, buy it, and get back out. There's terrorists in there. Don't stay long. And, and bring it back to the church. I think today is our cutoff day, so 
So grab some things off the tree, bring it back, and put it out there, and it'll be taken out to the fairgrounds, or just take it out to the fairgrounds when it needs. But, but you can do that. The third piece is, is that um, through our outreach, we're also a part of giving meals to up to 25 families that have a need. The meals are already paid for. We just need names. And so John and Lydia are out there by the door. If you have some names of people that have a need uh, that we can give meals to, if you stop and talk to them, talk to them. If you're wondering why we're doing the things with the kids at school, we can't do it through that other organization because we, we have to do it anonymous through the school. We can't give names for that. So it's a different piece. So we're going to help fund. We have three options here this morning, and we want to invite you to be a part of that. And so I'm going to have a prayer, and then the worship team is going to come and sing a last song. And, and think of the words of this song and how God is calling us to use our part and, and give everything to him. And then the ushers are going to bring an offering. They're going to start in the back, and, and they're going to raise the offering, come to the front, and then we're going to leave it here, and we'll have a prayer of dedication at the end. So would you join with me in prayer? <clears throat> God, it's overwhelming for me when I look at the world around us and even the community I live in, and I see all the chaos and the difficulties. God, even in my own life, it sometimes feels like everything is completely out of control. But God, I know that I need you and we as a community need you and our world needs you. So I pray, God, you will help all of us, each one of us here. You will help us understand how we can be your hands and your feet, your men and women, your children on the street, and we can do our part. And so, God, as we leave here today, I just pray that you will just empower us to be able to apply the fact that love is near and it comes through you. God, I invite you to guide us and lead us in all of life. In Jesus' name.